Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Silver Hills Search Engine Marketing Made Easy, a way to find more small commercial loans through search engine marketing. My name is Joe Altamonte. I'm your, uh, the Assistant Vice President of Business Development for Silver Hill. And joining me later today to go over some uh, program notes about Silver Hill will be our Vice President and National Sales Manager, Juan Barcelo. And also on the line today is the our most uh, modest member of the group, Zach North, who decided not to put his picture on the screen, but he is our director of marketing and uh, he has played a huge role in putting these webinars together. So he'll be chiming in in a little while and uh, helping answer some questions about search engine marketing as well. A couple of housekeeping items. Um, since we have such a big group, so far 58 people have logged in. We have uh, over 250 registrants. So obviously it will be hard to uh, open up the lines for verbal communication. So please feel free to use the questions box to enter your questions. We will stop maybe two or three times during the presentation and then again at the end to answer as many questions as we can possibly get to about the content matter. Uh, also, uh, this presentation should not take the full 60 minutes, so we should have that time at the end. And then finally, uh, to everybody that is registered for this webinar, our marketing team led by Zach will be sharing a copy of this presentation for you. So if we're going at a speed that uh, you're in the middle of writing something and you missed it, uh, rest assured that uh, if you registered, you will be getting a copy of this via email. So we, we will talk about, obviously, the first and uh, biggest topic of today's presentation is search engine marketing for small commercial mortgage brokers. And one thing I will throw in there is that a lot of our clients that we do business with also do residential business and a good percentage of them specialize in residential business. So uh, we have no problem if some of the ideas that you learn from this presentation today help you find more residential business. Even if it doesn't result in a deal coming to us or, or, or a commercial deal, um, use these ideas in your overall business to help make you more money. This is a, a educational session and of course a little bit at the end we'll talk about our programs just as a reminder how to get started with us. But by all means if you find that uh, some of these tips and ideas help you with your residential business we are all for that we'll talk about the overview um, we have again over now uh, 65 70 uh, people on the line right now so there's going to be a varied level of expertise on the phone call from folks that uh, have never done this to people that are quite uh, versed in it so we will try to balance that gap uh, by being uh, both uh, comprehensive and um, again, not, uh, not, not flying too high over everybody's head today. So we'll get into the keywords, bidding strategies, and then the most important thing about a search engine marketing campaign is making sure it works. So we'll talk about return on investment and uh, some ways to track this. Also, Juan, our Vice President of Sales, will also take you through some, uh, some high-level overview of our sweet spot, the borrowers that we look for. So when you do get uh, leads galore out of your SEM campaigns, you know which ones might be a good fit for us and which ones you might want to take to a different investor. And then uh, we'll set you up on how to get started with Silver Hill, which is very easy. So let's jump in. Search engine marketing for small commercial mortgage brokers. So this slide shouldn't surprise many people that uh, the overwhelming market share to the search market is with Google. In fact, in February of this year, and you can literally Google this information, uh, Google accounted for 62.6% .6 of all searches done in the month, and that's over 14 billion searches. And if you think about the way you operate today, uh, I would not just say that everybody on the call has Googled today, but has Googled things multiple times today. Now, some people prefer Microsoft, and there are other search engines like AOL, and uh, that's about the only one I can think of off the top of my head. And that goes to show that Google itself is really where uh, most of the search 
traffic goes. And for that reason, we're going to really focus in on Google at this presentation. But just a couple of other notes. For extra exposure and potentially lower cost per click, uh, if you do use Bing and Yahoo, it's not a bad idea. You can get extra exposure, as I mentioned, but also since there is less competition, sometimes you can uh, mitigate your cost by keeping the cost per click a little bit lower on Bing and Yahoo. So you might want to look into that as well. Also, later on, we're going to discuss the use of third-party vendors to manage your SEM campaigns. And when you're considering who to use, a good question to ask them is if they manage just Google AdWords for you or if they manage them across all three major search engines, Google, Bing, and Yahoo. That's an important question to ask because you can get some extra bang for your buck if you do use all three search engines. But from an informational standpoint, we will talk about Google primarily today. But we do have a poll question, and for that, I will turn it over to Zach quickly. And Zach, what is poll question number one? Hey everyone, so here is the first question. Have you ever launched an SEM campaign before? We just kind of want to see how experienced you might be in this field before we talk more about this presentation. I'll give you a few seconds to answer. All right, so Joe, it's kind of interesting. We have a little over 70% saying no. So we wow. have some people who are new to this and a few experienced people as well. All right, that's great. That's a really good mix and glad we have some experienced people on the line as well. Uh, but good, uh, this next slide should really, uh, really speak to the folks that are looking to get into this type of digital marketing. So thank you for that, Zach. So uh, for the experienced folks, this one might be a little bit obvious, but um, you know, sometimes when you're doing a search, even myself included, I, I'm not really paying attention to whether the result is an ad or not an ad. And on Google, they don't make it uh, abundantly clear except for that little ad uh, icon to the, to the lower left of the, of the headline. But um, Bing and Yahoo, uh, I believe uh, it's Bing that might shade the ad a little bit more. Uh, there could be ads off to the right and also down below. But the dead giveaway is the word ad, of course. And then down below are your organic searches. Now think about, as a consumer, when you're searching for things, some people I've heard have said, I don't click on it if I know it's an ad because I don't trust it, or I think they're just there because they're paying. But Google has gotten very good at uh, placing ads, paid or otherwise, based on relevance, not just what you say you're gonna pay Google. It's all about user experience. And if Google finds people are uh, literally avoiding ads, uh, they will no longer serve the ads that are causing that poor response rate. So Google definitely takes in relevance into an account. And what is the difference then between the paid ad and the organic listing? Well, SEM is another word for search engine marketing, of course, and pay-per-click, you might hear it called PPC, it's the same thing. And PPC is the most literal term for search engine marketing. You pay when somebody clicks on your ad. Now, you might have heard some people call the ads at the bottom of the page organic or even free listings. I guarantee you that that first listing for all intents and purposes to that particular business was not free. Uh, SEO, which is a different topic altogether, is search engine optimization. And that is a way to optimize your website so that it comes up high in the organic listings. And that takes a lot of expertise. And in a lot of cases, there is investment there as you uh, might hire third party vendors to do the, you know, do the work for you, especially your web developers. But for today, we're talking about search engine marketing and that is paying for clicks, not necessarily paying for your ad to appear. And we'll get into that in a minute as well. So take for a minute a gander at the picture on this slide and consider that that might not be the best person for the job of repairing that car. I think the problem is quite obvious and uh, he looks like he's maybe barking up the wrong tree there. The point being is search engine marketing is a lot different business than mortgage brokering. You on the phone are all very educated and expert at closing 
loans, whether they be residential or commercial. So if you are really serious about doing a good digital campaign with a strong SEM program, you may want to consider hiring an SEM provider, a digital ad agency that can manage cost-effective campaigns and can do that um, across maybe all three search engines. But ultimately, the job of the SEM campaign is to bring you more business. So that should always be the common goal between you and your vendor. Keep that in mind. So if you do use an outside vendor, it's still important to educate yourself on the basics of SEM and SEM reporting so that you can properly assess the job your vendor is doing. So just saying, hey, vendor, run with it. I trust you. I don't recommend that either. But it can save you a ton of time. And time is money, especially in the mortgage business, if you do consider hiring a third party to manage your SEM campaigns. So a lot of times people, when they talk about SEM campaigns, they use the term, I'm buying keywords. I buy keywords on Google. Well, that's not technically true. I mean, it's semantics, but really you're not buying anything until somebody clicks. The keyword bidding is an auction. And so the way Google determines which ads show up for which keyword searches is a number of factors that we'll get into in the next few slides. One of them is the bid. The, is bid and the best quality score, which we'll touch on today, will get the best placement. And notice I didn't necessarily say the highest placement. Google's algorithms can determine which placement on the page typically gets the best results, not just with clicks, but with conversions and so forth. So a lot of people want that coveted top spot on the page. Uh, it, history shows that the top spot may get the most clicks, but also gets the quickest bounce rates uh, as people tend to shop. So keep that in mind that, you know, anybody walks in your door and says, I guarantee you the top spot, number one, that's nearly impossible to do. And number two, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best spot. Um, and the bidding is saying, I won't pay more than this for a click. And when you get in, uh, I'll give you some links. You see some on this page uh, where you can set those things. And how do I know what to bid? There's some good links at the bottom of this page that we'll talk about that as well. Some more on that in a second. Again, you don't pay when your ad shows up. You only pay when somebody clicks on your ad. So you tell Google what you're willing to pay on a monthly basis and how much you're willing to bid on your particular keywords, and they will paste that spend throughout the month. So to get some deep dive information on that and create a Google account yourself, you can certainly click there. Some of you might prefer to say, hold on, let me do some research on some digital ad agencies or call some friends that are doing it and go that route. That's okay too. But even so, I would recommend getting involved with the choosing of your keywords. And there's some great tools at the bottom of the page there. The best of which I believe is the Google Keyword Planner. They have the best data because it's Google. And what that will tell you is the most common search terms for your particular industry, how many searches per month, um, what the average cost per click for a lot of those keywords are, and you can get yourself some good intel before you go run and, and say, here's my keywords. Say, and there's a couple other tools there. SEM Rush is a really effective uh, company. WordStream, of course, I've got some information from this webinar from WordStream as well. So all of these hyperlinks actually do click through to those tools or to your Google Ads Get Me Set Up campaign. So not only is this uh, informational, it's actually practical where you can get going if you really wanted to uh, jump off and, and, and get started. Here's an example of the WordStream tool. And this one's very generic. There's a lot more granular information that you can dig up on WordStream and especially the Google Keyword Planner. But one thing about this really stuck out to me when you're choosing your keywords. Now I, put in the topic commercial mortgage loans and my query for this particular report and notice what came through. In fact, commercial didn't really come out at all, but a good poll question would have been, what do you notice the ones that are circled, what are they all about? I'll let you noodle that for a couple of seconds. And the answer is they all have to do with pricing. So what does that tell you about your keyword strategy?
Well, not only about your keyword strategy, but you can't, uh, you shouldn't bid on mortgage calculator if your site doesn't have a mortgage calculator. That's that's one way to to annoy a user is when they click on an ad when they're looking for a mortgage calculator and they get to a place where they can't calculate a mortgage. Um, and we'll talk more about those things as well, about uh, negative keywords and other things that can help you avoid attracting people that either looking for services you don't offer or um, don't need the services you do offer. But just a good example there of the type of information. So you don't have to just take flyers at the keywords you want to uh, bid on. You can get some educated help. Speaking of negative keywords and all of this stuff, all of these things, these items are things you can enter yourself into the Google AdWords tool or have conversations with your third party vendors. So this is very important. We, for instance, at Silver Hill do not do construction loans. But if we put in there in a, a broad match, which means we don't have to match the exact query somebody types in, it just has to match the terms that we're bidding on. We could write commercial mortgages. Uh, commercial mortgages is our keyword we're bidding on. Somebody writes commercial construction mortgage. We could possibly show up there if we don't write construction as a negative keyword. So now we're going to get a click or a phone call about a construction loan. We'll pay for the click and we'll waste uh, valuable time talking to somebody about a construction loan that we don't do. So if there are things like I would think for, for folks like those on the line, a good example would be reverse mortgages. Some of you do them, some of you don't. If you don't, you're definitely bidding on terms that include the word mortgages and home. I would definitely include reverse as a negative keyword so that anytime somebody's searching for reverse mortgages, you don't show up just because the word mortgage is in their search query. Now it's not just about keywords, right? Now your ad shows up, we need to make the best use of your ads. So just as your keywords should be relevant, your ad should reflect the keywords being searched. So in the Google AdWords tool or in some of the backend tools of your vendors, you have the ability to um, segment and group keywords with certain ads. And that's getting into a little bit of the advanced area, but um, you know, depending on what your keyword segment is and what you're trying to get out of that particular ad group, uh, if somebody's looking for a commercial real estate loan and they click on that ad, it should take them to the exact thing that they are talking about bidding on. They also need a reason to click. Okay? It could be rates, you know, a time bounded offer. It could be something that uh, no one else does. Call here, we're the only one that does commercial loans for churches connected to gas stations. I guarantee you if somebody needed that and you put that in there, you'd get a quick click. Um, a competitive advantage, whether you close loans quickly, whether you have the lowest rates in, in a particular uh, type of loan and incentives. But the, I think the, a really critical part of your ad campaign and your ads is that it takes them to the relevant page. If somebody's looking to get a rate quote right now and they click on that ad that says get a rate quote right now and they come to a page that says Bill Johnson Mortgage has been in business since 1984 and we are in you know Grandma Johnson's old Italian restaurant that's a nice story but it's not going to uh, appease the person looking for a low rate on their on their loan. And you see on the screen a picture of the ad. There's something I have there called site links that I'm going to talk a little bit about, a little more about in a second. Um, site links are extensions of an ad. You see there at the bottom, call now for a low rate, commercial real estate hard money lender, right? These don't cost any extra money and they can each be linked to a different part of your website. And it's free to set them up in Google AdWords. So the folks that don't use them simply aren't really putting forth the full effort. There's no reason not to use them in my opinion. 
And according to Google, I'm getting ahead of myself because this is actually on a slide, but according to Google, when they initially started the uh, enhanced site links, which I believe are right here, they found that there was a 30% boost in uh, click-through rates for ads that had extended or enhanced site links. So utilize them. You can actually request up to 10 of them. Now, Google will never serve more than four to six of them at a time. Uh, there's something I used to call, or I still call OGK, which is only Google knows. So you can request these, but there can be times where your site links won't show up or they'll show up without the ad copy below each site link. So uh, again, Google's main goal is to get clicks. So when they can serve them, they will serve these extended site links. So what are they? Example pizza store is the main ad. Those order online now, store locator, deals in your area, returning customers, those are the site links. Now they can show up by themselves, but the enhanced site link is the ability to add context underneath each of those site links. So I think that is very important. If not for anything else, uh, get that extra click-through rate because they have more options to click on. But if you notice, it takes up a ton of real estate on the page. So now all eyeballs are probably hovering around that particular ad, at least for the pizza store. And hopefully everybody had lunch because now I'm going to lose half the people running to the pizza store. Also, there are uh, something called a call only ad for people that would be served only on mobile devices. So there's a little bit of budget you might want to put aside for that, maybe 10% of your budget for folks uh, that would be searching for mortgage company on their mobile device. Some businesses this is better for, like tow trucks. Uh, mortgages, I would say, keep a small budget for that. Most people, when they're really getting down to doing mortgage research, probably do it from a bigger screen than their phone. But still, um, you know, we see Rocket Mortgage talking about applying for a loan right on your phone with one push of a button. With all due respect to Rocket Mortgage, good luck with that. But um, yes, call only ads are ads that show up on mobile devices and only give the user the ability to call you. So the call is actually viewed as a click and is charged that way. Uh, location extensions may or may not be important to you. Uh, your location might be your home. So if, you, if it is, I, I would say maybe not use your location extensions, but uh, at least have some copy in there that, that uh, highlights how you're a local. Call extensions on the mobile phones. These are not call only ads. These are regular ads you can click on, but you can also click to call which makes it easier for the user. And then, you know, most mortgage companies are open Monday through Friday. I know you take a lot of appointments on the weekends and that's fine, but in your reporting, you'll be able to see the days and times that the activity happens. So once you start to get some results in, consider day parting and budgeting your spend by time of day or day of the week to maximize most um, of the activity but to also uh, use as a staffing tool. You know, hey, I noticed that Mondays we get a ton of calls, Fridays it, 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 um, it backs off. Maybe we'll have two people at the front on from Monday and one person on Friday, that type of conversation. And then finally, well, not finally, another very relevant part of the SEM campaign is what's called a quality score. This is Google's measurement. And there is plenty that you can do to try to affect your quality score. Um, quality score runs between one and 10. It is a Google assessed rating, and it has to do with a lot of things that are known. And then of course the OGK, the things that only Google, or in the case of Bing or Yahoo, what they call their scores. Um, again, there's a lot of secret sauce, as they like to say. But quality score, if I had to be very generic about it, is about the quality and relevance of your keywords and ads. So there's a lot of factors that you want to make sure are going into your keyword strategy, your ad copy. And one thing I haven't talked about is your website. And you know, when I'm talking to particular brokers and business owners about their website, this is always an uneasy conversation because nobody likes to hear that their baby is ugly. But some of your websites are struggling. 
So what I recommend is that you take a good hard look at your website because not only is it the, as we call, virtual storefront for your business, it can severely affect conversion rates for money that you spend to drive traffic to your website. You're spending money on SEM or SEO, or, or maybe not spending on SEO, and that's the problem. You're spending money on digital display, on mobile ads, and all this traffic's coming to your website, and they've got to click 16 times to find out how to submit a, le a lead form. So really take good care of your website. And, uh, you know, I know your nephew's boyfriend just graduated from you know SUNY whatever and and is a, a good graphic designer okay but I really recommend using a professional web developer uh, in, in lieu of that click through rate give them a reason to click like an incentive incentive or a time bounded offer we talked about that and your budget so when talking about budget, those tools that I shared on that earlier slide are good tools to help you determine what your budget should be. You can get a, a good look at the um, search volume per month, decide what share of voice or what share of that search volume you want to go after. You know the cost per click or the average cost per click, and you can come up with a reasonable plan to reach a certain percentage of that search volume for any particular keyword. So my advice is don't tip your toe in the water. If you know that the average cost per click for commercial mortgages is $5 and you want to spend $150 a month, do the math. You're not going to really get much of a, and you know the, you know, the closing percentage of these loans and the conversion rate of a, of a phone call to a, a loan application. You've really got to put some uh, investment into it. Here are some bidding strategies to consider as well, right? So uh, some of you may have had the experience where somebody said, you know, I, I just searched for you by name, Johnson Mortgage and Miller Mortgage came up in an ad. I don't think that's really cool. And sometimes it's not, but depending on the, um, depending on the type of competition you run into, it may or may not be a strategy for you. So yes, it does give your ad extra exposure to those looking for your competitors where you might have a, a competitive advantage for a particular type of, of loan, but it also may lead to a negative user experience, which also could lead to a poor reflection on your brand. So just be careful with it. Um, if it's something that you really need to defend your backyard with, or you know that there's competitors doing it to you, sometimes it is good defense mechanism. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm Switzerland on these ones. I'll leave that to your discretion. But those are things that you can consider. Bidding on your own company name, which seems like it makes a lot of sense. Uh, beware of the vendor that promises you very, very low costs per click. Because one of the strategies for guaranteeing a low cost per click is including your own company name as a keyword and not limiting the budget towards that keyword. So when, you know, somebody's spouse calls and says, honey, can you bring them the milk home and Googles you instead of just, you know, speed dialing you um, to get the number there. Now you've just wasted some money on somebody who already knows about you. And most of the people that Google you by name are looking for you anyway and we'll find you one way or another. So cap your allocation on that so you don't waste a large chunk of budget uh, by reaching people who are already uh, fans of yours. And long tail keywords I think are critical the smaller the business that you run. Um, it does help drive the cost per click down and get more qualified searches because when you bid after loans or mortgages or home loans or home equity loans um, so is you know so is lending tree so is bank of america so is wells fargo so you're competing in your small backyard against national lenders like that so have a little bit more uh, granularity to your keyword strategy with one big caveat in orange there, the more granular you get, you will start to see your traffic dwindle. So you do need to keep some level of generalness uh, to, your, to your keyword strategy. Um, but uh, as we'll talk about next, geo-targeting could be your way of doing that in a, in a much more affordable way. So 
Zach, before we get to poll question number two, I'll have you ask the poll question, and then maybe you can check the questions that have been typed in as well. So, but first, uh, poll question number two. Zach? Sure. Launching right now. Poll question number two. Do you focus your digital marketing strategy on specific geographic regions? Or do you only really launch nationwide campaigns with your marketing efforts? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer that. In the meantime, uh, looking at some of the questions, uh, quite a few people are asking if, if you'll receive a copy of this presentation. And yes, we will send you all a recording of this presentation tomorrow. And since this presentation includes some hyperlinks, I, I think we'll also include uh, the deck itself. So you can click on those links and, and and get to those resources that Joe has provided here. And I think we're good. We have about 66% of, of the audience saying that, yes, the focus digital marketing strategy on specific regions. And I think that's uh, nice to know for your next slide, Joe. And I'll, uh, I'll close this here. Awesome. All right, thank you, Zach. And so this this then this becomes as important as we talked about um, going up against the big guns like Bank of America and Wells Fargo and, and uh, Quicken Loans and, and what have you, that it's smart to geo-target, obviously, even though you might be set up or your company might be set up to do loans all over the nation, uh, really considering where your bread and butter is from a geo standpoint. But there is an important distinction to make between geo-targeting and including geo-modifiers in your SEM strategy. Geotargeting is by the physical location of the searcher's device. So this is a screenshot taken from, I believe it was Google AdWords, um, but it is of if I were to literally uh, pick zip codes in Chicago that I wanted to target. And it gives me a little outline of where I'm targeting and that's where my ads will show up so long as the person's device is searching from within those zip codes or the internet thinks their device is in there because we know there is margin for error when it comes to IP addresses. Now, geo modifiers can come really important. So some of us would stop and say, well, I geo target, that's all I need. But think about the people that are uh, real estate investors or people that are moving to the area. This is really important with residential loans where they are looking for homes, you know, home loans in, uh, Orland Park, or the examples I put on the screen, commercial loans, Chicago land. So geo modifiers aren't necessarily names of actual towns. They can be um, lingo for areas of town. Uh, Portland, Oregon, for instance, Pearl District. Well, that's not, no one lives in Pearl District, Oregon. They live in Portland, Oregon, and the section of town they lived in is Pearl District, but somebody might specifically want to live there. So they might say homes. Pearl District or Commercial Mortgages Pearl District or so forth. Um, Wrigleyville in Chicago is another good example there. So number one, it can ha capture searchers that aren't putting in a specific area by the name of the town, something that would register on a map, um, and by people who are out of town looking to relocate or just buy an investment property in that area and might want a local lender. So always add those location terms to your loan programs or to your SEM programs. Now, in, in summing up a good strategy, all of these components really need to be in place for an SEM campaign to work. Keyword strategy, ad copy, we talked about those things at length. Relevant landing pages that convert. So not just sending them to a page that has the information they're looking for, but something they can do to uh, get them in contact with you. Namely, you know, we, we like form fills and emails and phone calls, something that can really uh, drive them to you. Response, what happens when a user converts? What do we do back? What is our process for managing leads and traffic? How are you staffed? Um, in some cases, uh, one of the best problems you can have is going, oh no, I have all these leads and uh, the, uh, no one to answer the phone. So make sure we get <laughs> make sure we get that in line as well. And Zach, what is our final poll question of the day? Sure, launching right now. The 
Final poll question. Do you use a vendor to help you run digital marketing campaigns? And we'll give you a few seconds to answer that one. All right, well, I think we have a pretty good idea. About 80% saying no, Joe. Wow, okay. So a lot of the people on the call today are running their own campaign. All right. And I'll question now. Yeah, so uh, which is technically speaking the most cost effective way is you're not paying a middleman, but uh, maybe there has been food for thought for allowing you to use a vendor. I, again, if you have the time and the, and the capability, you know, we're, we're, I'm all for it, but it's something to consider as well. So here are some things to consider, especially if you are doing it yourself. How do I determine what my ROI is? Well, first, what is the goal of your campaign? you know, have that clearly laid out for you. What am I looking to accomplish? Now, I think if we're all mortgage brokers, the ultimate goal is always closed loans, but there's other things along the way that can lead to those that are goals as well. Loan apps, phone calls, clicks, form fills, um, things that usually happen on the path to purchase, as we like to say. And then how are you gonna track how these people find out about you? Can you ask them? Sure. I wouldn't trust their answers 90% of the time. Uh, they come in and say, hey, I saw you on Google. That's about 99% of the time will not happen. Website analytics, sure, but I think you'll see the most important one is Google Analytics. It's free. There are classes galore out on Google itself, which is probably the best one, but there's also vendors that come to a town near you and do a three-year Google, three, three, not three-year, three-day <laughs> Google Analytics course. Um, but hey, you can go on Google Analytics one hour at a time and take their uh, tutorial and get and uh, get qualified that way as well. But Google Analytics will tell you a lot of things. And uh, also, if you are going to use a vendor, the screenshot on this page is a dashboard from a full service digital vendor that also sells search engine marketing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg of what they'll tell people. Uh, what their impression share is, uh, how many clicks per impressions, the click-through rate. By the way, a good click-through rate on search engine marketing, depending on how competitive it is, you want it between 1% and 3%, but they're getting better and better. You'll see good uh, good click-through rates as, as high as 5 to 10% in some campaigns, especially with not a lot of, of competition. Always use Google Analytics to track. Google Tag Manager, now we're getting into some weeds here, so I won't go deep into this, but that's a link as well. Zach noted these are these are hyperlinks. So Google Tag Manager is a way you can put certain code on your site to track people as they make their way around your site and, and determine where they came from. Uh, you'll hear terms like, uh, you know, attribution and, and and last first click attribution last click all those good things if you really wanted to get analytical about it also utm codes can really help you tell information about which campaign you're running for instance if you're doing residential campaign and a commercial campaign you can code the urls the click-through urls to uh separate the reporting so when somebody clicks on a hey residential home loans it doesn't just go into a click number that you see there uh, 1,092, you can divide it up by segments and you can do that in Google Analytics, set up segments and see the reporting based on segments and make your decisions there. You can A-B test ads, you can A-B test campaigns. Um, and that brings me to some more information about tracking. All right, call tracking. Now, there's many vendors or uh, it, like if you're doing your SEM campaign yourself, you can call a call tracking vendor. Marchex is one of them off the top of my head. March, like the month, EX. Um, and there's some other vendors out there that you could probably just Google call tracking vendors. But what you're going to look for is a vendor that can tell you the time of the call, the call duration that would record the call. It will tell the caller that it's being recorded. Um, sometimes in the mortgage industry, we have to be very careful about that from our uh, our compliance standpoint. But it isn't; it's something that is available. But you can also use this for a lot of information other than just did my 
campaign work. You can make decisions about staffing in terms of when are these calls coming in and how long do they take. There are training opportunities. I've listened to some of the calls for a lot of small businesses, and um, I'm being very polite when I said when I say that there are plenty of training opportunities for the people answering the phone that can maximize the call coming in. There's nothing more maddening than your advertising dollars working but your staff uh, not taking full advantage of those advertising dollars. So um, I think call tracking is a very important part. Even if you're uneasy recording the call, uh, most call tracking companies have a button where they turn the call recording off and you can get a lot of other good information from the call. Okay, so these are just the basics, folks. Um, Google Ads, you know, living up to its name, you Google Google Ads, and you can it'll take you from start to finish and setting up a campaign if you haven't already. Many of you that do have a campaign, uh, I'm sure are familiar with it, but this is the best way to get going, and that that uh, that hyperlink will take you right to the page I'm showing you on the screen today. So before I move into Juan's section on the Silver Hill sweet spot, I do want to check in with Zach and see if we have any um, have any pending questions. Hey, Joe. Uh, not so much a question, but, but a great point that someone actually just brought up is that it's, it's also really important to think about creating a Google business page, not just for your ad account, but even uh, for your organic search, which means people just Googling you. Uh, it's, it's a great place to set up your, your company address, your general phone number, and then and just the content that you put on your website is more easily seen when you have this created. And, and I think we find that so much of what we do happens through Google anyway, that it's a valuable, a valuable thing to do. Uh, it doesn't cost any money. Uh, it, it, it was a, good, a great recommendation, actually. So I, I wanted to make sure I, I shared that with, uh, with everyone here on the webinar, and I'll send it back to you. Ooh. Thank you, Zach. And yeah, a, a very good point. Excellent point. All right. Um, without further ado, our uh, Vice President of Sales, Juan Barcelo, is on the line and uh, he knows our programs better than anybody. So he will take you through a overview of Silver Hill. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? And thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Just want to, uh, and thanks everybody on the line for being with us. I just want to give you a quick recap on what we do as far as commercial real estate lending is concerned. You know, we definitely like to offer uh, a lot of value in the content that we uh, present to you, and marketing certainly always is a very popular one. So thanks again for being with us. Um, so just want to give you a, a quick rundown of a few of the things that Silver Hill does in the commercial real estate finance space. We are a alternative solution to, you know, otherwise bank fallout or bank turn down loans. Uh, we're looking typically, you know, for loans between 250 and $5 million, although we can go as low as 100,000. Um, we offer 30 year amortizations, which is very different than what banks do. Uh, and what some of the other folks in our space uh, as well offer. And most importantly, we have different programs, but you know our very uh, popular program right now is our 30-year fix. So it's basically a 30-year fixed loan on a commercial property, which is not typical at a bank or most other lenders uh, in this space anyway. So we're part of the, the, the small balance commercial lending space, and, and we finance uh, several different property types uh, all considered commercial, of course, or investment property. So that, that's really our focus. Um, you know, just put up a few things here on what kind of like our sweet spot is. Uh, we do a lot of cash outs. About 50% of our pipeline is cash out refinances. So a lot of a lot of folks use our program for cashing out equity from their commercial property to go and reinvest into either their business or to reinvest into other uh, investment properties. So um, this is just going to kind of like a quick view of some of the, the, the different features that we offer. All right. Okay, uh, you want, yeah, you want to move? Yeah, there you go. So, uh, you know, I mentioned we do several different property types. Uh, we put them in two tiers. Tier one would be your typical apartment building, five plus residential units. 
Uh, we also do mixed use properties in which you have a, a commercial component as well as a residential component. And then obviously uh, the different types of commercial property that we do. So your typical, any retail unit, strip center, uh, any kind of storefront, um, office space, warehouse, self-storage facilities, uh, light industrial properties. We can do automotive properties, you know, to, you know, not to include gas stations, but everything else considered automotive, body shops, garages, uh, dealerships, all that stuff we'll look at. We can do restaurant and bars, uh, which most lenders do not do. Most lenders do not like automotive and restaurant bars, uh, but we can do those. Uh, we also do daycare centers um, and finally mobile home parks. Those are the eligible properties that we can work on. Now, very important to know what we cannot work on. So, you know, and this, and this becomes all relevant to our conversation earlier about SEM is, you know, a lot of the times you can use uh, some of the different property types that you want to focus on for financing into these keywords. So um, this kind of gets you some more specific or targeted attention uh, with regards to marketing on online. So that's that's very important. So and we do something similar to that, obviously. And you know the idea is we we pretty much are looking at the property types that we can do um, in order to generate that activity online. But what we can't do is we can't do raw land or agricultural properties, working farms, um, any kind of new construction. Uh, I think Joe uh, showed a, a, an example of that. Any kind of new construction or rehab, we wouldn't do, so we definitely wouldn't market for that, and we would be more specific about marketing to that particular uh, issue. Uh, environmentally sensitive properties, any properties with past environmental issues, as I mentioned before, gas stations, uh, typically we will stay away from dry cleaners, uh, anything presenting an environmentally, uh, um, you know, potential environmental issues, we're going to stay away from. Um, churches, your traditional church buildings, we won't do. Uh, any adult entertainment, we're not going to do. Uh, Cannabis-related properties, this is a you know recent phenomenon that, that really there's a lot of requests for, uh, and most lenders around the country, you know, really can't do anything about it at this point. We're no different, and, you know, we do get a lot of requests, but unfortunately we can't get them done. Um, properties that need significant rehab, this is kind of like the construction stuff. You know, if a property is not stabilized, uh, occupancy is low, uh, you know, the property is gutted or needs to be redone inside or has uh, several down units, uh, that's not a deal that we're going to want to work on. And finally, special use properties. This can be any type of property that's built out spe specific to a certain commercial business use such as marinas, ice skating rinks, golf courses, movie theaters, bowling alleys, um, you know, that kind of property, very special use, and we'll stay away from those. So how to get started? You know, our website, and Zach does a great job with our website um, and really making it very user-friendly for our brokers. You know, go onto the website, there's going to be a lot of different things on there. The most important thing is that you can price commercial deals uh, on our website and even generate a term sheet for your um, for your borrower to review with. So you know, there's downloadable guides. There's you know, we have a free marketing toolkit that Zach put to get together, which gives you uh, an idea of how to use different marketing techniques depending on what you're looking to do. Um, finally, we have a lot of videos on there on how to you know, do business with us, you know, how to do commercial real estate business in general, very helpful stuff, and some product-related uh, videos as well. The most important thing, though, is you got to get on there, get registered, get a password, and start using our pricing calculator. So if you have a deal, you basically want to package it up. Um, you know, it, it's, it's rather a simple process. Um, the idea is to package it up as, as good as you can on the front end to get a more clear uh, either approval or denial. You know, we like to give a, a, quick, a quick answer regardless. So it's important to have all the information up front 
in order for us to make our quick analysis. But basically, just to give you a rundown, uh, we need an application, whether it's our application, a 1003, a personal financial statement, or another type of application. We need a, a, a completed application so we understand what we're looking at. Um, we need a tri-merge credit report. Um, so preferably, we would use uh, you, the broker's credit report, so long as it's a traditional mortgage tri-merge credit report. We, we will look at the monitoring reports that people do nowadays, but uh, we, we won't use them for, for underwriting or anything else. Typically, we will not pull credit uh, as long as we can close the loans for six, you know within 60 days. We don't need a new credit re report. Um, a rent roll for multi-tenanted properties. This basically is a schedule of rents. Tells us how many units, square footage, how much they pay rent each month, and what are their expenses related. A lot of times that's included as well in a rent roll. By the way, we have all these forms on our website as well under forms uh, you may need. So again, another reason to go on our website and check out all these documents. Um, P&Ls, operating statements. This basically tells us what the expenses were for the property for the last two years. It's very important to understand historically what the expenses are so that we can forward that information to the appraisers. Um, finally, if, if you have an owner-occupied owner loan request, we can, do, we can do those two ways. We can do a full doc loan like a bank will, although we're a lot more flexible and we look at them a little bit differently. Or we can do a bank statement loan. This is very popular for owner-occupied businesses that either get turned down by banks or get turned down by the SBA because their tax returns don't add up. So we have this program where we take 12 months of business income from the bank statements um, and we um, underwrite to that cash flow. Um, and finally, if you have a purchase deal, we need the purchase contract on the front end. Unfortunately, we don't do um, you know, pre-approvals, so we need to work on deals that are actually uh, going to happen. Um, and I want to, there's a few questions I'd like to answer. I think they're relevant. Um, Joe, can you go on to the next slide? Let's see what's on there. Okay. So before, you know, I'll, I'll leave that slide up there mm -hmm. while I answer some of these questions. Um, so I got a question on top MSAs. So generally, generally speaking, we do the top 200 MSAs. Okay, we like to stay away from rural areas. Okay. So that's that's very important. Um, we, you know, typically a lot of lenders will not do rural property, um, so there's more risk involved in that. So typically the top 200 MSAs. You know, other other than that, if you have any questions about whether it's rural or not, or it fits, I always say call one of our salespeople. You can find them on the uh, contact us uh, section of the website, and you'll get the number uh, or email of one of those individuals, and they can give you kind of more detail around that. There is a, a lot that we do around, um, in general, around like doing exceptions around that, depending on the property type, credit scores, and all that. So, but typically a top 200 MSAs. Um, Let's see another question here. Any restrictions on use of cash out? We don't have any restrictions on the use of cash out. It could be used for whatever reason. We don't ask that question. Um, uh, let's see. What about a mixed use building where the commercial component is a church? That's a good question. We can do those as long as the church is not more than a 40% tenant in that uh, property. Um, all right, Joe, let's move on. $500 deposit, guys. I mean, we are in our space the lowest when it comes to getting started with on a loan or processing on a loan. We front the money on the appraisal. We basically take a $500 deposit as a you know get, get started uh, you know a goodwill deposit, and uh, we we foot the price of the diligence reports and the uh, the appraisals and everything, and then we collect the difference at closing. So uh, here's my information on the left. You can give me a call or email me, or again, you can go to our website and find one of our folks to talk to. Um, and Joe, of course, who did a great job with this presentation. Um, that's his information. You can also reach out to him if you have any questions. Um, Joe, you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I would just say that um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we, you know, for any marketing uh, help as well, or help with the website and with, you know, there's a lot of great stuff on there as we mentioned that Zach put up there, uh, scripts from for emails and and phone calls and any kind of non-branded uh, marketing stuff we can help you with. So, so and and thank you very much for everybody for attending. All right, thanks guys. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Juan.